Number 10, sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations, okay? They invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies copies of the Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now these books were ignored at first, but upon a second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the temple of Jupiter. So if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. Number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar, when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crassus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened happening at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city. Cause guys are dumb asses. That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruin the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. Number seven, sewer goddess. I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in eight minutes flat with him. The god of toilets. There's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome, all this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, AKA Big Drain. Eventually this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains, nice. That's a lie actually. As a kid, I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I'd pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't wanna get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff, it's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So it's a lose-lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one, the loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step on how to make your own loincloth, and I tried it, and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and you know, zippers and stuff, but that's that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're 
building a castle, anyone watching? Like say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here or else let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense because you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period, that's it. Or else this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor of the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet. And then again, the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool. That's like the worst way to drown too. I'd say chamber pots were safer, but when it comes to waste, out of sight, out of mind, sadly, just get that away from me. Just downhill, get it out or else we'll drown in it, probably. Number three, Roman shampoo. Okay, when my hair grew out over the pandemic, I had a panic attack. I've never, I don't know what the f to do. I had a huge wake up call. I've never had long hair before. I don't know what to use in this mop. I still don't, clearly, evidently. All I had growing up was the classic four in one shampoo for guys, that wasn't working out at all, that sucked. I needed some curl cream, okay, separate, Jars of items, not just a five-in-one with mouthwash on your head. That's those aren't those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses, also very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> He's so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift, and let me tell you, last year, I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm? That's it, I don't want a PlayStation, get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks, they weren't Vans skateboarding socks, they weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the eighth century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the second century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the fifth century, socks were worn only by the most holy, which is kind of ironic because socks have holes in them. You get the joke, there it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today, a little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts, it was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I of course mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools, Great, I gotta send an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have King Tut's Cursed Artifacts. We will kick off this list in the 18th dynasty. 1332 BC, King Tut was the last of his royal family to rule, and for ages now, the pharaoh's treasures, politics, and social status have remained a mystery. Until recent days, it would be extremely hard to get a glimpse at some of the ancient belongings once owned by King Tut, but the new Grand Egyptian Museum has a solution. It was set to open in 2018, then finally 
finally come 2021, it did. Now, that's great. That's quite the exhibit. But the contents displayed inside certainly aren't for the faint of heart. For the first time in history, King Tut's ancient belongings, the artifacts discovered with him, will be on display. Prior to the museum being open, we only saw 150 artifacts from his tomb. They took all of the pieces on tour, but now this museum will house thousands of artifacts. The final resting place for King Tut's collection. That's over 7,000 square meters. What a display. Now, when we look back to ancient tombs, we can find many ancient curses. If you have a chance to visit the Grand Egyptian Museum, or if you saw this King Tut world tour, I'm jealous, but please don't touch anything. Just leave ancient artifacts alone, perhaps. The curses belong in history. In our number nine spot today, we have the Tower of London. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to like this video if you're enjoying it. It does really help us out. I have been here myself. I did a little tour, took some pics. I had no idea how dark the history was here. Kings were beheaded. Queens were horribly beheaded. And on top of the already existing dark history, witnesses also say they've seen an apparition in the Tower of London. A headless ghost maybe floating around like it's Hogwarts. How jarring is that? Hopefully no one's, you know, just taking their head off to say good day. A common sighting is that of Thomas Beckett, a martyred saint, and Anne Boleyn. If you visit the Tower of London, you might catch a glimpse of the second wife of King Henry VIII. Anne Boleyn was found guilty of treason. She had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rockford, aka her brother, George Boleyn. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's groom of the stool. And on top of all of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that all of these claims were a bunch of rubbish and wasn't even around when all of these things took place. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, in October 1533. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool. She was kind of busy. All parties involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536. Then, two days later, Anne Boleyn was executed for her crimes. That didn't happen. In our number eight spot today, we have the Terracotta Army. My least favorite mummy movie, but it's still a good time. Welcome back to Hollywood, Brendan Fraser. Let's go! The tomb of Emperor K Qin Shi Huang, China's first emperor, is an unbelievable discovery. In this tomb, we can find 6,000 statues, but they all have unique carvings on their face, as if to suggest these are custom statues accurately representing a soldier. All 6,000. Back in 1974, farmers were digging a well. This was 20 miles east of Xin'an, and they stumbled upon a pit that helped all of this history. We believe that around 700,000 workers were putting together this masterpiece for three decades. Archaeologists have discovered 8,000 statues in total, with horses and chariots, the emperor's tomb, of course. A grim detail here is that in the emperor's tomb, streams of mercury were put around the floor of his burial chamber, and in 2005, over 4,000 samples tested positive for mercury, so to this day, less than 1% of the tomb has been excavated. It's simply just just too dangerous. The emperor believed that after he had passed, he would have to face the spirits of his enemies, so he wanted to be prepared, even after death. The emperor decided to close the tomb before the workers even had a chance to get out. He was worried that his enemies had found out, so there was lots of statues and dark histories in this one. In our number seven spot today, we have Highgate Cemetery. Heading over to England yet again, London's Highgate Cemetery is beautiful, but back in the early 1800s, it was booming. The city's population was growing, meaning more people were dying. We needed more land for bodies, graves were being placed in between houses and shops, so Parliament built seven cemeteries to help out. The third, built in 1839, was Highgate. Come 1854, the cemetery was full. It was beautiful. Everyone wanted to be buried there. An odd desire, but look at it. How inviting is that? It was so popular that they added another 20 acres. More bodies, let's do it. No worries, keep piling them on. By the time World War II came along, the cemetery was completely abandoned. In 1960, the cemetery was officially closed. Buildings began to fall onto themselves. The landscaping is just a mess. It certainly looks the part now. Today, many stories are passed around of these men in dark robes. They're said to practice dark rituals in Highgate. It's not uncommon to see apparitions in the cemetery, but red 
red-eyed demons, Highgate is just another level. In our number six spot today, we have Newgrange Tomb. Okay, time to get wild. Over in Ireland, there's a tomb built by Egyptians. It's called Newgrange. It's as old as the pyramid, so the belief is that Egyptians also built this. It was first discovered back in the late 1700s, but it's been closed ever since. It's a mystery who or what is inside, but the folklore surrounding the tomb is too good not to include on this list. Locals believe the tomb is a gateway to another realm and that it was built by goblins. If and when this tomb is opened, it's believed goblins will come rushing out evil goblins, that is. I didn't know that there was another kind. Are there good goblins? Does that exist? I certainly hope that this doesn't happen. Maybe it's Alexander the Great. Maybe they buried him impossibly out of the way. Or maybe it is full of goblins. I simply just don't know. In our number five spot today, we have Bangar Fort. Back in the 16th century, King Maddo built the massive Bangar Fort in India. The population of this small town was around 1,000. It was a beautiful fort. Many considered this place a luxury. Rightfully, so though, it looks like a set piece from Game of Thrones. Legend has it that Princess Ratnavati, who at the time was living in the luxurious fort, was the talk of the town. Dudes were proposing left, right, and center. Princes from all over would come in and try to take her hand in marriage. One day when visiting town, a magician saw the princess shopping for perfumes, so he planned on using black magic on the princess. He mixed it with perfume that she was admiring, but it didn't work. The princess smashed the perfume, and as the bottle broke apart, the magician then cursed the entire fort and those living inside of it, which is really the only reasonable response, you weirdo. Only days later, a war erupted around the fort and there were many, many casualties. To this day, Bangar Fort is said to be extremely haunted. In our number four spot today, we have the Crooked Forest. Forests are already creepy, but this one looks like it's straight out of a Tim Burton film. The Crooked Forest is in Poland. There's around 400 odd shaped pine trees near the town of Grafino. These trees are said to be about 90 years old, and all of the trees from the base, they immediately bend towards the north, and then they slowly curved back towards the sky, like other trees. Despite this odd bend, these trees are otherwise healthy. There's been so many theories, but none of them really stick. Some suggest it was a gravitational anomaly, but that's a little too far-fetched for me. I don't know. This is an interstellar, is it? Other theories claim that there were heavy snowfalls that would weigh the branches down, which could check out, but why is it just a select amount? I've lived in Canada my entire life. I'm from the prairies, like the snowiest of all the places. We have so much snow, and I've never seen a Sleepy Hollow tree. All right. My favorite theory is that farmers were trying to make the tree curved on purpose to make stronger wheels because the grain direction would make for the natural curved wheels. Again, nobody knows for sure. What are your thoughts? Do we like the wheel theory? I'm gonna keep a spare tree tire just in case. I'll keep it stored safely in the trunk. In our number three spot today, we have Huska Castle. According to folklore, Huska Castle, which is located in the north of Prague in the Czech Republic, is built over a bottomless hole that leads directly to hell. The legends claim that the 13th century King Ottokar II offered a pardon to any prisoner who agreed to be lowered into the pit in order to report what was down there. The first prisoner who was lowered into the pit only lasted 30 seconds before he started screaming in fear. Sounds pretty horrible. No way I'd volunteer as tribute. Legend goes that when he was brought back up, his hair had turned white, and apparently he saw these half-human, half-demon creatures that flew through the darkness with scaly wings. The castle was built over the hole without things like a water source or any kitchens, and it is said that this was because it wasn't actually meant to be used by humans, but rather a place to capture the demons should they choose to rise from this mysterious hole. Even demons have a place to crash now. How nice is that? In our number two spot today, we have the Turkey Gladiator Arena. Ah, yes, another arena. Arena, another staple in history filled with gruesome combat in the name of entertainment. Gladiator 2 was confirmed by director Ridley Scott, so who knows, there's a chance we may see another Gladiator Arena like this one in the sequel. An 1800 year old arena was discovered back in 2020 while we were all stuck inside watching Carol Baskin. They found another Gladiator Arena. This is so exciting on one hand, but the history that lies here 
not so pleasant. Its purpose was thought to be the same as the Colosseum, you know, to host these massive professional gladiator bouts with wild animals making a cameo here and there. This arena was active, we guess, around 200 AD when the Severan dynasty was ruling the Roman Empire. If betting on animal fights was your thing, you'd travel to this place. Hope you have trail shoes and great knees. I'm weak just looking at those hills. In our number one spot today, we have the Valley of the Kings. We started off this list in ancient Egypt, so we might as well finish there. After all, when it comes to ancient mysteries or ancient curses, Egypt still has so much to offer. It is said that any thieves who dare enter or disturb the slumber of the deceased kings shall be cursed and shall perish. Well, this applies to archaeologists too. Howard Carter and his team back in the 1920s had come across the discovery of a lifetime, finding the tomb of King Tut, launching the study of Egyptology. We're still finding tombs in Egypt to this day. That place is a literal treasure chest. The thing is though, after the discovery, some researchers on Carter's team started to feel under the weather. Maybe there was a bug going around, maybe it was too hot, or maybe it was just the curse of the pharaohs. Some men on his team perished from blood diseases or undisclosed circumstances. Many of these ancient tombs have warnings, and I think it might be time we start listening to those. 